call this a target-rich environment for any self-respecting deity. <laughs> and not a natural disaster in sight. <laughs> you can't explain that, Dave. <laughs> Perhaps he's distracted, torturing Christopher, pulling his wings off. Seeing my family out there protesting, standing behind barriers with their Gary signs, espousing the ideology of their God, the prevailing emotion for me is sadness. I see the results of a lifetime of controlled indoctrination. camera here pretty soon because my batteries. I see a system that vilifies new ideas, shuns new discoveries, clinging rather to ancient notions about the nature of our world. A system deprived of new ideological genes, leading to a form of intellectual inbreeding that begets distorted, ill-formed beliefs. I see what happens when individual choice is restricted by false consequences. I think of the young people who paid the price for leaving that place, cut off completely and permanently from all they've known and loved. I know the years of fear and anguish they will face as they struggle with the messages hardwired in their brain. The messages that constantly threaten their resolve to be freed of the shackles of hatred and judgment. The certainty that overwhelms them at times that they will suffer an eternity of torture for their decisions. I consider the terrible waste of intellect, talent, and resources. Resources that could be used to heal, grow, and support, used instead to cause pain and express hate. I think of the myriad of others who've suffered in similar dogmatic environments, their adult lives hounded by the shadows of fear, guilt, and self-doubt. And finally, my heart goes out to the millions who see and hear the cruel message of my family. A message that is met with tacit approval by too many in this society. A message of rejection that seeps into their hearts, leaving them to wonder why a creator made them gay just so he could punish them. It's a terrible, terrible waste. They called me a rebel. For years I bore that label with shame until I realized that confronted with the God of my father, rebellion is the only moral option. that I had displeased God and would, would be punished for it. I avoided religion for years until I married. With the birth of my children, I decided to return to religion and seek the kinder, gentler God of the evangelical Christians. I studied, read, listened constantly to radio programs, prayed incessantly, and asked Jesus into my heart time and time again. During those years, I lived a double life, staunch apologist by day and troubled skeptic by night. I took my questions and doubts to my friends in the church, and when they couldn't answer, I went to the pastor. Still dissatisfied, I sought out local and even national leaders of the Christian movement, always searching for that elusive nugget of truth that would seal my faith. Then one sunny September morning, the illusion of a personal God that I tried so hard to, to believe in exploded over the skies of Manhattan. Even as the ashes and ruin of this horrific act of blind faith settled over New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania, I watched people across the country scrambling to that same irrational altar for their answers. In the fierce storm of emotion that rolled across this country, one realization rose to the surface of my mind with blinding clarity. Certainly this mechanism of unassailable blind faith 
is one of the greatest risks mankind faces today. once asked what one thing he would change about this world if he could. He said he would do away with the insane idea that faith is a virtue. If you invoke faith as justification for your belief, you must accept the same from others. And every person who retreats to faith there's a measure of responsibility for every act of hate and violence justified by it. In spite of that realization, I despaired of how we might ever become a nation that revered reason. But today, looking out at this amazing crowd, I can actually see the path. All around us today is the evidence that we're not alone in our convictions the supernatural need not be invoked for humans to have morality and purpose. In our insistence that knowledge be distilled by a rigorous process of inquiry and evidence, and in our willingness to admit that sometimes we simply do not know. I have a friend back in Calgary. He's a staunch humanist of 80 plus years. We meet for coffee regularly, and I take those opportunities to mine the wisdom of his years. He's the kind of man I would have as a father were it my choice. Ross talks about humanism as a city on the hill, a beacon for the world to see and understand that we can be good, no better, without God. It's a worthy goal that I would strive for. I've had the pleasure of working with several organizations over the past few years that promote these ideals. The Center for Inquiry needs no introduction as a leading international advocate for reason and science. CFI in Canada started nearly five years ago and we've seen tremendous growth across that country with branches in all major cities now. I've also had the opportunity recently to start working with Recovering from Religion. This organization fills a critical niche, providing education, counseling, connections, and community for the swelling number of people who struggle with the many issues associated with walking away from their religion. With over 100 branches across the U.S. and Canada, the leadership of Recovering from Religion is working overtime to meet this growing demand. When I began my activism work a couple of years ago, I saw it as my duty, even an obligation. But the people I've met and the opportunities I've had to learn and discover things that I never would have have made this journey well worth it. And I would challenge each of you, if you're not already involved in this movement, when you return to your communities, to get involved. final thought that I try to remind myself of every day. It's something the British philosopher Bertrand Russell said in an interview he gave late in his life. He was asked what he would most like to say about his life and the lessons that he'd learned. This was part of his response. There are two things I would like to say. One intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should want to say is this. When you're studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you want to believe or what you think would have a beneficent social effect if it were believed, but look only and solely at what are the facts. That is the intellectual thing I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say I should say love is wise and hatred is foolish. Thank you all very much.
Victor Nate Cubs.